Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Energy Efficiency and Industrial Decarbonization. What can the Industrial Assessment Center do for you? My name is Matthias Wagner with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance here at Ohio EPA, and I will be moderating this morning's presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things to help you participate and engage with our presenters. Our presenter this morning is Scott Erdley, a graduate research assistant at the University of Dayton Industrial Assessment Center and the current IAC student lead. And now I'll turn the mic over to Scott. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, so this is energy efficiency and industrial decarbonization. Really excited to be here, um, and especially because we have a lot of services that we can provide facilities all across the state of Ohio. Um, so just to, before we get into the thick of it, um, I wanted to introduce myself uh, and uh, my teammate, uh, Sean Cap. So my, again, my name is Scott Erdley, uh, currently a master's student uh, in the Renewable and Clean Energy Engineering Program at the University of Dayton. Um, and Sean is a current PhD student uh, in mechanical engineering, also at UD. Uh, and both of us uh, work at our university's industrial assessment center. Um, and as you can see up here, humble brag, um, we do keep ourselves pretty busy. Um, uh, and as for myself, um, in addition to currently pursuing this master's degree, um, I'm also coming from industry um, and actually uh, also <laughs> having worked at Ohio EPA. So it's exciting to be able to work with Ohio EPA again. Um, tons of great services on both sides of the house here. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to, to find um, some extra value um, in, in what we can offer and how to make those connections. So uh, for today's webinar, um, I wanted to make sure that you um, had an understanding of what the IAC program is um, and what services are available, but also um, identify uh, our top five recommendations that we make um, uh, or have made uh, over the past 10 years uh, for the several <laughs> hundreds of assessments that we've done, um, provide a case study of what these recommendations look like in real life, um, and then also kind of tease out some, some additional types of recommendations that we, we often make. Um, and then finally, uh, I definitely want you to walk away today with some tools and resources um, that you can use to establish an energy assessment uh, program at your own facility um, that's uh, free and publicly available. Um, you could get started today if you wanted. Um, and as well as uh, 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 an exciting funding opportunity that's coming up. So again, overviewing of the industrial assessment program. Uh, this is um, a nationwide program supported by the U.S. Department of Energy um, and specifically uh, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. Um, so this program actually came out of um, a response to the 1970s energy crisis. Um, and the goal of the, the whole program is to assist small to medium sized facilities improve their efficiency. And that includes energy efficiency, of course, but also productivity um, and materiality. Um, so this program really has evolved uh, beyond just energy to include many different uh, facets of sustainability in general. And we're growing uh, every year. So we are up to 37 um, centers across the country, all housed within universities. Um, and are essentially the bread and butter of the program um, is we provide no cost energy assessments to eligible industrial and commercial facilities. Um, so not every IAC does both, but um, we're very proud to say that UD um, has been awarded the funding to do both. So here in Ohio, um, whether you're an industrial facility or commercial, um, we may be able to help. So I, I highlighted eligible because <laughs> uh, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Um, so because it is a grant funded program um, with the mission to help small and medium sized facilities, uh, we do want to ensure that we are equitably distributing our services and resources. So um, we do have some eligibility criteria. What you're seeing on the screen here is our industrial criteria. Um, so this is, um, uh, you know, what we're looking for here um, are standard industrial code uh, facilities between 20 to 39. So this is our manufacturing. Um, it's a pretty wide range, though. Um, so I don't want anyone to be discouraged if you're not quite sure if you're within that range. Um, and additionally, uh, the DOE also has uh, a drive to assist our wastewater treatment facilities across the nation. And so 
Um, if you are a wastewater treatment facility uh, interested in, um, in an assessment, uh, we do have these approximate size limits, so the three to 10 million gallons per day. Um, and then uh, for any uh, kind of more, I guess, private facility, um, we're looking at gross annual sales below $250 million. Uh, I'd like to emphasize gross, so I understand revenue could be much greater, uh, but we're, we're just interested in the gross. Fewer than 500 employees and annual energy bills more than $100,000 and less than $3.5 million. So this is our general criteria um, for our industrial facilities. For commercial, um, the program's still being built. So um, actually now's a great time to uh, apply <laughs> because we, we do not have nearly as much uh, eligibility criteria. Um, and what I would say too, uh, I put this up here so that you had a reference, but um, please, you know, if you are at all interested in assessment and aren't sure, if you are eligible, or maybe you're just outside one of these ranges, um, please go ahead and contact us and apply. Um, so we are able to make some executive decisions, we're able to make some exemptions. Um, so I don't wanna discourage anyone based on this. Um, I did wanna give you kind of an idea though, what we're looking for um, and approximate size. So if you're at all interested, please contact us because we can probably work with you to make it work. So I just want to highlight that, again, those 37 sites um, are located across the nation. So perhaps you have a sister facility that's in another state. If you go to that website, the IAC.University website, you can actually put in your uh, the zip code of whatever facility you're interested in, and it will provide um, you know the, the, the five nearest IACs. Um, but if you're in Ohio, uh, <laughs> it, it's pretty easy. Uh, your IAC is the University of Dayton. So we cover all of Ohio, uh, parts of Indiana, parts of Kentucky. We have gone up to Detroit before. Um, so if you're at all within within that area, uh, you're you're probably going to be um, assigned to us anyway. So, uh, but you know, let us know if you have any questions. Okay, so uh, quick poll. So. Um, of curiosity <laughs> just to see kind of where we're at um when was the last time an energy assessment was conducted on your facility um and this is not at all <laughs> you know there, there's no uh, brownie points here i just want to see where people are at so if it's never that's perfectly fine in fact uh very selfishly i'll say that's exciting to us because we're here to help um you know how was it in the last one to two years three to five years maybe it was five years or more or maybe you don't know, maybe you're new to, to your role or new to the facility and you're not sure. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to see kind of just where we're at. All right, thank you, Scott. And I just launched that live poll. If everyone could please uh, take a moment and make your selections now. Uh, we've got about two thirds of the responses in. So if you could please just take a moment and get that in. Uh, if you haven't yet, I'll be closing it in just a moment. All right, well, let's see what we got. Looks like you've got a pretty even spread here, Scott, but about half of our respondents either have never gotten an energy assessment or don't know the last time that one was performed. So great, now I'll hand that back to you. Thank you. Um, and again, absolutely no judgment there. Um, in fact, um, I think this is the, so this is the first step of the assessment is finding out what is the history of your facility? Um, what do we know about it? Has an energy assessment been done? If the answer is never, um, or even if you don't know, uh, then we absolutely um, could provide, uh, and, and if you're eligible, 
we may be able to provide that that first assessment for you and give you a baseline. If it's been in the last couple of years, but perhaps maybe there's been like significant changes to the facility or you're changing operations, um, or maybe the assessment was done by, um, you know, uh, another another consulting firm or something like that, and you'd like another opinion, um, we can still help. And then for those who it's been like five years or more, um, I will say IAC assessments, um, you know, even if, even if you've had an IAC assessment done on your facility, um, if it's been five or more years, um, you are eligible to have another one conducted um, with the understanding that, you know, things have, may have changed, um, processes may have changed. And so we're here to, to follow up and see what we can do to help. All right. So um, what do these assessments entail? Um, so, the basic assessment protocol. So, what you can expect, um, you know, if if we if we find that you're eligible, uh, you're ready to go, um, then what we're going to do next is we'll conduct a baseline analysis. So, this is kind of the pre-assessment. So, before we ever get on site, we'll we'll do the baseline. Then we'll get on site, actually do a site visit, tour the facility. Um, afterwards, we'll take all that information, roll it into a comprehensive final report, um, and then finally. Uh, uh, we'll have an implementation survey to follow up, you know, maybe nine months later or so uh, to see what was useful, what were some challenges you faced, that kind of thing. So for each one of these steps, I'll just briefly kind of go through the nitty gritty of, of what you can expect uh, for an assessment from the IAC. So this baseline, you're probably all pretty familiar with, you know, the, the idea of reviewing your annual utility bills. That's that's where we, that's, you know, a very natural place to start. Uh, it is an important process. Those those bills tell us a lot about how the energy is being used, what type of power factor you have, what kind of demand um, is being is being charged. Uh, but more importantly, um, we'll take all of that and then we'll do a deep dive of the rate structure um, to see are there any opportunities that we can find to help you almost like a, on an administrative level. Um, where where are these charges coming from? Um, and we provide that information to you. Um, and then the real meat of the baseline analysis is what we call a lean energy analysis. So it's the same idea um, or like theory as like lean manufacturing, but it's this idea that if you're spending money on energy, then that energy should really be going towards your your product, whatever that may be, um, and or uh, you know uh, weather dependent factors. So you know space cooling, space heating. Um, so what I wanted to point out here, the reason I have these two graphs, um, these are so these are things that you might see uh, from a lean energy analysis. The one on top, um, this is actually uh, a determination of how your facility um, use it. In this instance, this is for electricity. So how your facility uses electricity in relationship to the outdoor air temperature. So for example, um, you know we often We'll conduct this analysis first, and then we'll get on site. And uh, facility managers may say, "Oh, you know, we 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 our thermostat is set at, uh, you know, uh, for cooling maybe 65 or 70 degrees." Um, but based on the the data that we have from how the energy is being used, you'll note here um, that blue triangle. Um, it's showing us, uh, based on our statistical analysis, that actually. It looks like weather dependent electricity usage uh, begins at an outdoor air temperature of about 51, 52 degrees. So what that so this already is giving us information on what's happening. You know, is the HVAC system fighting itself? Um, are the internal heating loads higher than anticipated? And therefore, you know, you're actually cooling at a much lower temperature than you think. Um, so so using that data and that statistical analysis, we can actually draw out a lot of information before we even get on site. Um, other types of information that we get from that, so if you look at the bottom graph, um, so those green bars along the bottom represent independent usage. So usage that the, the statistical analysis may not have determined was either for production or weather dependency. Um, and then that lighter blue bar you can see is weather dependent. So this makes sense though, because if you look down there, it's by months. So those are those are the the cooling months. So we would expect to see higher weather dependency with electricity there. But again, the the thing here though is that all of that independent usage could also be just constant production. So maybe you run twenty four seven, or maybe 
I feel like, for example, for a wastewater treatment facility, you can't stop running. Um, so it doesn't matter what the temperature is outside, you're gonna still be still be running. Um, so the data won't necessarily show us that. So that's why once we go through all of this data analysis, it is so important for us to get on site and actually ground truth um, and speak to you. Uh, you know your facility best. Um, so we're there to find out what's going on, what's happening, how is energy being used. Um, I will, one last thing for the baseline analysis, if you do have um, an asset inventory, if you have an equipment list, um, we can actually then take all of this lean energy analysis, apply it to your largest energy users, um, and, and kind of give you an idea of where, where are the, big, the biggest bang for your buck in terms of savings based on equipment. You know, is it going to be your HVAC? Is it going to be, you know, your production equipment? Um, is it your air compressor? That kind of thing. So once we're on site, um, basically, so uh, we get one day. Um, so just as a heads up, our scope is one day, <laughs> uh, typically. Um, and uh, it's a very, it's a very busy day. It often starts off with, um, you know, a typical agenda would be we provide a baseline analysis overview. Um, then we we <laughs> spitfire a bunch of questions at you uh, to find out what what types of systems you have, what types of production are you um, are you uh, doing in your facility? Uh, of course, do a plant tour. Um, we begin doing calculations, uh, continue data gathering, and then before we leave that day, um, you will have our preliminary list of recommendations and our preliminary calculations for estimated savings. Um, so we do. We do make it a point um, that by the time we leave from our site on-site visit, you have your preliminary recommendations. And then um, after about four to six weeks, we deep dive each one of those recommendations and then develop implementation costs, estimated savings, estimated carbon emissions um, avoided or reductions. Um, and then again, we'll follow up in about one year, so nine, nine months to a year to determine what, if any, were of the recommendations were implemented. If not, why? What were some of the challenges? If you did implement them, what kind of savings are you seeing? Um, and all of that information actually is then used to develop our greater IAC database, um, which is publicly available. And if you were interested, you could visit the IAC.university website um, and see what types of savings um, facilities are seeing from these assessments. So again, the systems overview, um, you might be wondering, like, how deep do we go? Um, we do a pretty uh, thorough uh, investigation. So, of course, things like lighting and motors, um, uh, you know, process cooling, process heating, those are pretty straightforward. But we will also do an assessment of, you know, is it feasible to use combined heat and power? Um, what type of industrial refrigeration exists and how can we improve that? Uh, can we optimize the compressed air system? Um, is renewable energy feasible for this site or what kind of benefit could it provide? Um, so, you know, these teams are, are consisted of uh, predominantly engineering students, um, many of which are graduate students. And so we understand that you're busy focused on focusing on production. You, there may be many things that you are interested in or wanted to assess, but just haven't had the time. Um, so I guess, I'd like to emphasize that one of the value added to an IAC assessment is that we're we're there to help you. So if you have a project that you've been wanting to work on, or if you've had an idea that you'd like to suss out, but you just haven't had the time or or resources, uh, we're here to help. So we, we can help with that heavy lift. So then um, finally, uh, as I mentioned, that final report um, includes the detailed recommendations, estimated implementation costs and savings, as well as simple payback. Um, we prioritize all those for you so that you can see, you know, what would make the most sense to invest in first and then snowball that into the, the next ones. Um, and then our, not every IAC provides this, but ours provides a, it's called the 1230 method um, to attain net zero manufacturing. So we do provide um, a kind of bird's eye roadmap to decarbonization. So using the recommendations we provided for your facility, um, we'll do an economic analysis and kind of show you how you might um, move forward towards either net zero or whatever your, your goals are. So we can adapt this to meet um, what your facility is interested in. 
Um, again, the implementation surveys. A little bit more though on that one, two, three, zero. So um, not only will we provide you the energy efficiency recommendations, but then um, by giving this roadmap, we kind of also show how you could then go about maybe uh, purchasing renewable energy instead of purchasing standard, you know, whatever the grid mix may be. Um, and then beyond that, you know, if so, whatever you can't generate on site or purchase um, in terms of energy, what types of renewable energy credits or RECs are available um, to uh, negate any remaining emissions? Um, so again, this is kind of based on what you are interested in. So we can take this as far or <laughs> uh, not as far as, as maybe your goals are for the facility. Um, but we do want to emphasize that as the DOE is supporting and um, really encouraging facilities to consider electrification and decarbonization, um, this can be a great starting point um, for how, how to move forward. OK. so. Uh, for our top five recommendations, again, um, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so uh, we are now up to our 1057th assessment. Um, so we've we've been doing this uh, quite a bit since 1981, since we were established. Um, so in that time, um, not only have we been doing assessments, but we've been doing research. Uh, we've been trying to advance how we go about doing these assessments. Um, so uh i did want to share a little bit about what the university of dayton specifically has to offer um our clients uh who who receive an assessment from us so um as you can see here i kind of broke out um recommended and actually implemented uh savings um so i wanted to note this because um what we don't want to do is we don't want to uh limit um uh, what what recommendations we make. So you'll see that the recommendation, the recommended savings, uh, like cost savings, for example, are much higher than the actually implemented. But part of that is because uh, we want to make sure that you have all of the information and ideas available. Um, and we we do try to make them as feasible as possible. We understand that maybe you know anything more than a two-year payback isn't going to work for you. Um, but we still include those recommendations because we want you to have the information because you know the situation may change down the road. Um, but that said, we still do see a pretty significant implementation rate. Um, and then in terms of energy saved and emissions avoided, um, you know this these ten year statistics are just for our center. But um, if you go to the IAC.university website, you'll be able to see kind of the nationwide statistics on what we're seeing in terms of average savings average emissions avoided and it's pretty significant uh, so you know i think that sometimes we do wrestle with this kind of image of like okay so this is a student group uh, doing this assessment but i do want to emphasize that we endeavor to provide quality professional um, products um, and services so these are real calculations real savings uh, real emissions avoided so what, what are our top five? Um, so when I say top five, these are the top five most often recommended. Um, but a caveat to that is if it is most often recommended for us, that means that it that means that it's typically the most feasible, uh, affordable. Um, it has a uh, we're confident in its payback. Um, so that's that's why we selected most often. There's a diff couple different ways you could do this, uh, but we thought that this would be the most useful to you. Um, so these top five include uh, utilizing higher efficiency lamps or ballasts. Um, this, <laughs> to be very frank, essentially you can read this one as uh, retrofit to LEDs or switch to LEDs. Uh, number two, eliminate leaks in inert gas and compressed air lines. So fix your compressed air leaks. Number three, utilize energy efficient belts. Um, so I'll get into this more uh, in a second here, but essentially looking at what types of um, Belts are being used for your motors. Uh, number four, use variable frequency drives on your existing system. Um, and five, eliminate or reduce compressed air usage. So the number two was, you know, fixing fixing leaks. But number five, um, with regards to your compressed air, you know, where can we just not use it? So um, just to kind of uh, highlight what these recommendations really look like. Uh, so when I say 
you know, utilizing higher efficiency lamps and, and our ballasts. Um, the types of questions we're going to be asking you when we're, we're, we're on site, what kinds of light fixtures are you currently using? What light, 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 sorry, what lighting level is needed for your operation? So we understand that, um, you know, there are recommended light intensity levels for different types of work. Um, so, for example, if, you know, in your quality department, if you have to have that intensity of light, we will not recommend that you reduce it. We're, so our, we are never trying to interrupt your, your production or your process. But maybe in other areas, we, we can. Maybe it is overlit in other areas and we can reduce that. Um, can retrofits be made um, as the bulbs are replaced? So this isn't, uh, it may not be feasible for all light fixtures, but for many fixtures, you can do one-to-one -one replacements. Um, but what does that look like? So, you know, are you gonna, would that end up over lighting your space? Um, so we'll do those calculations. Uh, and you'll see here for each one of these uh, next five slides for the recommended, uh, top five recommendations, I'll have uh, the, the statistics associated with them. So times recommended, implementation costs, estimated savings, simple payback. Um, and for the sake of time, uh, I'm not gonna go through each one of these stats. Um, I'm sure <laughs> you, you all can read. And I also just wanna remind everyone that you do you will get a copy of this presentation as well. So you can review these um, at, at your leisure. So for this one, the big takeaway being uh, LEDs are a, a sure bet essentially. Um, and uh, even if you don't have a capital up front, if you can do uh, retrofits or replacements as needed, um, even that will have uh, pretty good savings. So eliminating uh, leaks. So this is, you know, do you have a leak detection program? Um, and how do you track and fix your compressed air leaks? Um, I can't tell you how many facilities we go to where we do see the tags. So they're, the tags are everywhere, um, but they're like two years old. Uh, and we get it. So especially nowadays, um, we're seeing, you know, maintenance staff are overworked and understaffed. <laughs> it's hard to find uh, and keep maintenance folks. So um, we totally get it. This may not be, you know, your top priority. And uh, most often your top priority is production. Uh, but, you know, sometimes um, based on how, how we calculate the uh, cost savings, it may be worthwhile to contract that work. Um, or it may be worthwhile to invest in, so this picture here um, is a sonic leak detector. So, uh, you know, in many facilities, you can just walk around on a Sunday and hear the hissing, but there's a lot of small leaks that you may not be able to detect with, with just your uh, normal hearing. Uh, but as you can see in that graph on the top there, even the smallest leak um, can add up to thousands of dollars um, over the course of a year. So, um, in fact, compressed air leaks, um, they can account for up to 20 to 30 percent of an air compressor's output, um, and that's that's an average. So in some facilities, that could be even higher, um, and that's all just money and energy literally uh, being blown out the door. So this is a big one. We recommend this almost at every facility. Uh, so for energy efficient belts. Um, so this is the idea that switching from smooth V-belts to notch V-belts um, can result in up to um, almost 2% efficiency savings, uh, but it also helps the maintenance. So this is a pretty easy one. You're gonna have to repla replace belts anyway. So even just switching from smooth belts to notch belts um, can result in uh, cost savings um, and reduced maintenance needs over the course of the year. In fact, for some facilities, as you can see here, you know, the average savings was found to be almost $4,500 a year. Um, especially if you have a lot of um, motors in your facility that can take advantage of this. So this is this is a pretty uh, fair bet. So <laughs> I'm sure some of you were probably groaning uh, when I mentioned variable frequency drives. Uh, that I feel like this is a contested topic. We definitely understand these are not applicable in all um, instances, uh, but where it's appropriate, so where the, the math makes sense, where the application makes sense, we have seen significant savings from installation of a variable frequency drive. Um, so, you know, for your pumps and fans um, that maybe, uh, you know, for like pumps that may be throttled um, or for fans on the HVAC or cooling towers, um, these, we, we often find that we're able to find pretty good savings um, by installing a VFD. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with VFDs. So variable frequency drives essentially 
instead of allowing the pump to just uh, operate on off, so either uh, full speed or, or not, or throttled, um, the variable frequency drive actually allows you to match um, the flow rate to the needed pressure. Um, and essentially in doing so, it takes advantage of the affinity laws um, or the relationship between motor power and speed. Um, and so in doing that, you know, even small reductions in speed can have significant reductions in power. Um, so the idea is just to match, match the need for the demand. Um, and, and, and just one last thing for throttling, you know, where we see throttling, we understand that maybe that's just how it has to be. Uh, that's, that's how the, the process works currently. But, you know, if you think about it, you're spending a lot of energy and money to, to drive um, whatever the fluid may be. And then all of that's being, well, not all of it, but the majority of it's gonna be lost once it hits that throttled valve. Um, and so it's just, it's a, it's a very energy intensive process that's not really providing any, any service once it's been throttled. So something, that, something to consider. Uh, and then lastly, eliminating press air usage. Um, so can we turn it off? Uh, so this is, you know, here it's specifically talking to compressed air, but I would say this is one of our most common recommendations just oh, around the facility. So, you know, can we turn off that CNC machine on the weekends? Can we turn off that motor when it's not being used? You know, uh, those presses, uh, we notice that when you are operating them, you know, they don't, they're not actually producing anything for several hours at a time. Could we turn them off uh, during that time? Um, of course, when we make these recommendations, we absolutely want to know from you, you know, is there a reason? You know, some equipment needs to warm up. Uh, some equipment, it doesn't make sense to turn it off because it's, it needs to be available at any given time. So when we make these recommendations, we don't do them in a void. We absolutely want to know from you, you know, almost always there is some reason. Um, but if if we can turn it off, let's do it. Because that's like the that's the most valuable energy savings is is the energy that we don't use. Okay, another poll. Uh, this is this is a bit of a <laughs> you know, uh, I don't want to say a quiz, uh, but uh, if you remember, um, on average, compressor leaks account for what percentage of a compressor's output? So one to five percent, five to ten, ten to twenty, twenty to thirty, thirty to forty. Again, this is on average, um, and I did mention it back in that fixed leak slide there. So, all right, thank you, Scott. And I just launched mm -hmm. that for everyone. So if you can please take a moment and select uh, what uh, your best answer is for the poll. about 75 percent of the answers in so i'll just leave it open for another few moments if uh, you can go ahead and make your final selection if you haven't already All right, I'll close the poll and share the results. Uh, looks like got 55%, said between 20 and 30%, and most of the remainder said 10 to 20. So it seems like people are paying pretty good attention. Now back to you, Scott. Thank you. And you know what? Uh, to be very fair to, this is kind of a trick question uh, because it does depend on your facility. Now, as I mentioned, the average is 20 to 30. Um, but you know, if you have if you have a leak detection program in place and you're fixing them. Uh, it could be uh, less than 20, less than 10, potentially. Um, if, if it's a very leaky facility, it could be much more than 30. So we have seen facilities where almost 50% of all the compressed air that they were generating was going towards feeding leaks. Um, we have a couple of different ways of finding this too. So I will say, you know, this is when we're when we're out on site at your facility. Um, 
we uh, we will request, you know, if it's okay with you um, to install data loggers on things like your your air compressors, um, then we can actually use that amperage data over the course of several weeks um, to see what type of power is being drawn during non-production hours. Um, and theoretically, you know, that's what we will assume to be feeding your leaks. There's other ways to do this, of course. Um, and if you have a leak detection study, great, we can use that too. Um, if you have, if you just happen to know what the CFM is, we'll take that too. But um, this can be really valuable for, for finding potential savings for a facility and, and tightening up the processes. Okay, so um, I did want to share with you again a case study of what, what an assessment looks like when it's all said and done. Those top five that I told you, um, I don't want to call them low-hanging fruit. Uh, they are essentially, but they're also very important opportunities for savings that don't require major investment. Uh, but in this case study, we'll show you a, a couple of the, the larger scale savings um, that we've been able to find for some clients. Um, so for this particular facility, um, so every every assessment we go on is given an ID number. So this one is UD1046. Uh, so this was our 1046 assessment. Uh, this particular facility was um, a heavy duty truck manufacturer um, and massive footprint, 3.2 million square feet. Um, so this one, I will say this was kind of a, a special case, but a really exciting one for us. This actually, um, I wanted to note that you'll see here their total energy costs do exceed what we would normally, um, our normal threshold. But this is, I use this because I wanted to point out that this is why you should still contact us, even if even if you're just outside those eligibility requirements, because uh, depending on the situation, we might be able to make it work. Um, so this was a very large automotive facility, as you can see here, kind of atypically. We, you know, we normally see a much higher electricity usage to, to natural gas, but at this facility in particular, um, you know, almost you know thir almost 33 percent of their total costs were natural gas, uh, which is kind of unique, and we don't often see that. Uh, but also uh, significant electricity usage. Uh, they did have a they did have a pretreatment plant as well, um, so their water um, was a bit higher than what we typically see at this size of a facility. So this is uh, their baseline results for their electricity. Um, so one of the interesting notes here, um, you can see on the left uh, where that change point temperature is, um, close to seventy. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, that is also consistent with their their thermostat set point. So um, what this indicates to us is that the the system is pretty well controlled. Um, and so what they're actually using versus what they set it to uh, is corresponding. And then another interesting note on the right here for the lean energy analysis of independent production and weather dependency, um, you see this massive independent usage. So before we got on site, um, you know, normally when we see independent usage, we often think of this as potential opportunities for electricity saving, um, because obviously if it's going to production and weather, that makes sense. But anything that's independent could be savings. Uh, but the catch here, and this is why it's important to get on site and not just rely on data, um, they operated 24/7. So some of the machines never turn off, or some of the you know the processes never stop. Um, so that's what we're seeing in this large independent usage. So um, we wanted to find out what was what was going on. Um, now for their natural gas, uh, we saw that um, very weather dependent, as you can see on the right there. Most of it's going towards just heating the facility. That large facility is going to have a, a large weather dependency. But there was also this large independent and production uh, usage as well, um, which could be ovens. It could be furnaces. Um, but here, um, I'll I'll show you. There was a there's a special thing um, related to their natural gas usage and at this facility. So this table is something that you know, you would typically see in um, a final report. Uh, so what we do is after all of the deep dive uh, recommendation calculations, uh, we then prioritize them based off of potential savings, um, internal rate of return, simple payback, um, and we kind of break it down. Um, like this to kind of show what are what are the top recommendations. Um, so the ones in red um, correlate to those top five that I mentioned earlier. So this particular uh, assessment 
uh, did include the top five. Um, so things like installing a VFD, um, reducing compressed air usage, uh, number nine, number 10, changing the belts, um, and then 14, LEDs. Um, and so those those were here, but we don't just do these low hanging stuff. You'll see, you know, sometimes we, we are always looking for potential savings. So things like number four, you know, trimming an impeller on the pumps, um, does could result in electricity savings. Um, installing ductwork to redirect waste heat from the air compressors back into the plant during heating months. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that there's a, it's really up to yours and your creativity on what types of savings we can find. We're really not limited in, in terms of that scope. Um, so ultimately, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, after deep diving some of these, but I just want to give you an idea that this is, this is you know, what types of recommendations we made for them. So things like reducing demand by shifting forklift charging. So I mentioned earlier, we, we do that rate structure analysis. So we also look at when is your demand being set. For many facilities, it's your peak usage for over a 30 minute period once a month. Um, you know, and oftentimes we see that peak occurring somewhere in the afternoon, typically when like cooling is going to be, you know, activating and it's the highest, but, but demand is, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that contribute to demand. So for this particular facility, they had tons of forklifts uh, and they were just charging throughout the day. So, you know, one thing you don't want is to be pulling greater demand during, during peak demand of the day. So this was a pretty easy one, just to shift it to charging them at night when possible, so during off-peak hours. Um, and just shifting that demand uh, resulted in an estimated savings of about $20,000. They had a massive thermal oxidizer. Um, so this, this was uh, to meet their uh, air compliance. Um, so again, with this being an Ohio EPA webinar, I would also like to reiterate we will never recommend something that's going to impact compliance or, you know, we want to know from you, you know, if we're doing this for a specific reason, we have to, it's, 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 it's part of our environmental controls. Um, we do not impact that. However, um, by investigating, we found out that it operates and it can operate in multiple modes. So this one has a high fire and a low fire mode, uh, but it was operating in high fire all the time, even during non-production hours, even when it didn't need to be running. So just by implementing controls to reduce from high fire to low fire um, during non-production hours, so when when their permit would allow them to, op to operate at low fire, um, we were able to find um, an estimated annual savings of 50,000 MMBTU of natural gas and approximately $262,000 um, just by changing the controls on, on their uh, thermal oxidizer. So like this is, this was a really exciting one for us because there's essentially no capital cost. It's just changing the controls, uh, changing the operations of it. Uh, so uh, I mentioned earlier with the VFDs. Um, so uh, if you wanted to know more about how VFDs actually saved uh, energy, um, I'd recommend maybe taking a look at this um, and reviewing it on the slides when you when you get a copy. Uh, but essentially, the idea being that if we can meet uh, if we can correct the pumps uh, speed to meet the pressure demanded, um, it does result in savings. Um, so not as exciting as that thermal oxidizer. This was only about like three thousand dollars a year. But um, I like to point these out because uh, even the the savings that we might consider to be smaller um, all contribute to kind of creating that snowball effect. So okay, you save three thousand dollars here. That three thousand dollars can pay for more light bulbs over here. Uh, so, you know, pennies add up to dollars. Um, so we do a lot of process heat and heat recovery type recommendations. So wherever there's a ton of heat just being like expelled elsewhere, um, we we can investigate if it's worthwhile to capture that heat and use it for something else. Um, so when it comes to air compressors, you know, 80% of that energy used by an air compressor uh, is converted to heat. Um, and so depending on where your air compressor is located, if it's located inside the facility, um, then it's, that heat helps you during heating months, like during, uh, during the winter, but it really hurts you 
during the summer when you're cooling. So being able to duct that exhaust heat and control it so that it goes into the plant during the winter and out of the plant in the summer, um, that can actually save you quite a bit of energy. So this was about $13,000. So replacing the V-belts, uh, the smooth V-belts with notch V-belts, they had so many motors in this facility that it actually ended up being close to $6,000 savings just by changing the belts. Um, and the, oh, this one was an interesting one too. So I mentioned, you know, a lot of these have been energy savings, but we also do materiality and sustainability. So this particular facility was generating approximately 650 metric tons of cardboard per year, and all of it was going to landfill. Um, if I remember correctly, they had two, I think they had a roll off just for the cardboard, and it was picked up twice a day, something like that. It was something crazy. Um, so, um, and working with them and working with the municipality um, and the, their waste management uh, provider, um, they were able to get a quote uh, for what it would look like to have a rebate given for the recycled uh, cardboard. And then additionally, we worked up um, cost estimates for if they were to install a baler, reduce the number of loads, how much could that save them? So while the energy savings weren't the the lion's share of like uh you know these weren't a great deal of energy savings for the facility this represented almost one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in savings and all of that cardboard was diverted from a landfill to a recycling facility um, so this was a really exciting one for us finally uh i i wanted to highlight this because i think sometimes we think oh, okay leds yeah 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 but look at this so this facility had about 5,000 fixtures, all of which were needing to be retrofitted to LEDs. So in doing the lighting assessment for them, um, we were able to find that they could, but just by retrofitting all those LEDs, uh, they could save upwards of $380,000 a year um, based on LEDs and better controls for their lighting. So, you know, don't, discount lighting, uh, especially if your facility is larger and has a lot of fixtures. Now, of course, this is going to take time for them to to implement, um, but I believe that they were they uh, were planning to do this within like the next year or two. Um, so for them, this was a very feasible, attainable um, recommendation with really big savings. OK, um, and I did want to round out today with some tools and resources for you to take home, um, things that you could use today even. Um, so we, you know, the industrial assessment centers, we have kind of a limited scope. We only get one day with you. Um, we will do our best to provide as much uh, savings recommendations as we can. But if you have more complex questions or need a longer term relationship, I really recommend uh, taking advantage of the, the Ohio Manufacturing Extension Partnerships Program. So it's, uh, it's an initiative sponsored by both the state and the federal government uh, to help small and medium-sized businesses increase sales, create jobs, uh, and generate cost savings. Um, so they do things like workforce development training or improve management practices, but they can also do things like, hey, we have these CNC machines. I think we can run them more efficiently. I just don't know how. Or, hey, I really want to use a different type of energy for this. Like I want to use, you know, if I want to decarbonize, I'd like to use hydrogen, but I don't know where to start. Uh, the MEPs will um, are a great place to start uh, for that assistance. We have five across the state. So if you go to their website, um, you can see which one's located nearest you um, and start that conversation on, on what kinds of services they can provide. Similarly, uh, the USDOE Better Plants program, this is a free program, completely voluntary. There's no um, you you are asked to make a commitment to reduce your energy intensity, but there's no um, there's not going to be any like punishment or fee or anything like that if if you don't. Um, the idea is that you're committing to doing this, and they want to help you. So as part of Better Plants Program participant, um, you will be assigned a technical assistance manager, so a dedicated person who works for for the DOE um, uh, who can help you essentially kind of do what the IACs do, but uh, over a longer period of time. Additionally, they help you develop your own program. Uh, so using the tools and resources available uh, and their technical assistance. You can also receive national recognition for participating in the Better Plants program. So this is also a great way to get like a, 
recognition for the good work that your facility um, is doing or wants to do. Uh, so you saw our um, our baseline energy analysis in the beginning. Um, this this is this was just rolled out by the Department of Energy. So this is a free service. Sorry about that. My dog just found a squirrel outside. Um, and so this uh, this is newer and not as robust as what we'll provide necessarily in terms of statistical analysis. However, if you're looking for a way to track your utility bills, see trends, um, do some of that basic statistical analysis, uh, Verify is there for you. Now, again, it's in beta, so they want you to use it and break it and let them know how it goes. So if you have any questions, uh, definitely hit up the DOE because they would love to work with you to, to see what's useful for you. Another uh, DOE, uh, again, these are all no-cost, publicly accessible um, uh, tools and resources. This one is called Measure. It's short for Manufacturing Energy Assessment Software for Utility Management. So all those calculations I mentioned before, um, so what we do when we go on site and we're taking measurements, collecting data, running the numbers, um, a lot of that has been organized into calculators um, and put into Measure. You can also, um, as a facility manager or as someone in charge of energy management, you can actually model your systems uh, for your facility in measure and save them. And then whenever you wanna do a what if analysis, it's as easy as saying, okay, what if, um, you know, so for our compressed air system, what if I change the set point, you know, from our current 120 PSI to 110, what kind of savings will I find? So measure is incredibly powerful. Um, it's also, uh, being developed every day. So if you don't find something that you would like to see there, let them know, they, they, they can build it. Uh, one last thing with measure, you'll notice that there's this treasure hunt button on the right here. So this treasure hunt, once you've modeled your facility in measure, the treasure hunt will actually help you develop um, an energy assessment plan um, based off of the information that you've provided. Um, so it's very cool, it's kind of, you, you could, probably build a whole energy assessment in-house program using Measure. Um, and if you are curious on how to use it or, or would like an in-plant demonstration, the DOE can provide that, especially to Better Plants program participants. Uh, another one that they've rolled out is called 50,000 Ready, so, or 50,001 Ready. Um, so this navigator um, is basically meant for anyone interested in getting ISO 50001 Energy Management System Standards certified. You don't have to get certified to do the whole the whole certification process. However, if you're interested in that, um, this is a really nice uh, navigator to help you go step by step on what types of documentation you need to develop to get certified. Now, the other nice thing too is that by going through 50001 Ready, um, if you complete it, so if you complete the navigation um, and have all the documentation in place you'll receive recognition from the DOE as a 50,001 ready facility. Um, so if you're not quite ready for full ISO standard certification just yet, because um, that's a bit of a process, uh, you can still get recognition for being 50,001 ready. Um, and then based off the documentation you've done through the navigator, you just hand that off to the, the certifi certifier um, and it, it makes the whole process much easier. Additionally, it'll point out if you are already ISO certified in say environmental management or environmental health and safety, this navigator will let you know, hey, if you have this other ISO standard, use that portion or that section or that chapter uh, or that documentation here for this because it's equivalent. So it also will save a lot of time that way. Um, getting near the end here. Uh, so this is uh, the database of state incentives for renewables and efficiency. We often joke, be careful when you're searching desire, but that, that's that's just the name of the database. They keep this updated regularly, um, so come back often. Um, but essentially, if you put in your zip code, this database will pull any potential rebates, grants, loan programs, um, initiatives uh, surrounding energy efficiency and renewable energy. So like, you can find anything from like, is there a rebate in my area for replacing light bulbs? or you know, what kind of incentives are there for installing renewable energy? So this is a great database to use. And like I said, it is kept up to date um, and it is worthwhile coming back to, even if you don't see something right now. Um, 
it is a little tough in Ohio right now. Uh, there's not a whole lot in terms of incentives, uh, but hopefully that, that's going to change soon. And certainly this will also let you know of uh, federal incentives um, and things and other opportunities that may ex exist out of this, uh, outside of the state. All right, this is my last slide, um, or the, the last uh, uh, resource I wanted to provide, but we're really excited to announce that the DOE is funding what they're calling the Industrial Research and Assessment Center Implementation Grants. So by getting an Industrial uh, Assessment Center assessment, so an IAC assessment, you are, you've begun eligibility for this type of a grant. So um, they don't have all the details out just yet, but what we do know is that these grants will be upwards of $350,000 cost share. Um, so some of these more capital intensive projects that you wanna do for, you know, maybe a, maybe based off a recommendation that we made as an IAC, um, the DOE wants to help you implement them. <clears throat> so again, we don't have all the details just yet, but this one's really exciting. And by having an assessment done by us, you're like already, you know, uh, you're halfway, halfway towards this. So uh, very exciting. And with that, uh, we'll have our last poll of the day. Uh, again, just because <laughs> I threw a lot of acronyms at you. So what are some DOE tools that you can use to conduct your own energy assessment in your facility? So is it measure, balance, verify, both A and C, so both measure and verify, or none of the above? All right, Scott, I just launched that poll for everybody. So if you can please take a moment and select what you think is the best answer to the poll, uh, we'll have that close in just a minute here. Okay, that's about half of responses in. If you can please submit if you haven't yet. All right, looks like most people have answered, so I'll go ahead and close the poll. And I'll share those results with you. About 75% of respondents selected both A and C for measure and verify. So back to you, Scott. Excellent, thank you. All right, great job, team. Yep, so I know there's a lot of acronyms out there. And yes, measure and verify are both tools that you can use to do your own assessment. So I know we are running up on time, so I did want to Close out with, there we go. Okay, so if you're interested, the best way to uh, request um, a new cost energy assessment or, or ask us if you're eligible or you know start the process is to email us at udayton.iac at gmail.com or you can give us a call at 937-229-3343. Um, as a heads up, we are students though, so the email is the best way to make sure that we catch you um, and start that process of gathering the information we need to determine eligibility. Um, or if you just have any questions about the program, again, they are no cost, but certainly I think people have, um, you know, if you, if you have any particular questions, we're happy to, to answer those or set up a meeting. Um, okay, and that, that's all for me today. Uh, I believe the Ohio EPA just had a few last words, uh, so I will pass that back to Matthias. All right, thanks so much, Scott. And actually, if you do have a minute, we had a couple questions come in. I was hoping you could answer just real quick. Yeah. Um, first of all, which I think you just said, we did have several people asking about the cost for a uh, analysis from you guys. Yeah, so just to reiterate, this is a no cost program. So that we are supported by the Department of Energy through grant funding. So if you are eligible, this is no cost to you. So I say no cost uh, in the sense that we do not ask for anything. Um, so 
it, by participating in the program, of course, we do, there is an expectation that um, you might have to spend a little bit of time in gathering data, uh, you know, your utility bills, that kind of stuff. And I do recognize that your time is valuable, but in terms of actual cost for the assessment, there is none. Um, we just ask that you you help us because <laughs> we're going to need um, you know we're going to need your help in getting that data. So so if you can if you can spare a day for with us, um, that's that's all we ask. All right, we can't beat that. And then uh, the other question we had a couple of people asking was for those gross annual sales and employee numbers. Were those for an entire company or just the site that you would be coming oh, into? Oh, great question. I'm so sorry. I meant to distinguish. This is site specific. So we understand that you may have a parent company or you may be part of a, a larger corporate structure. We, are, When it comes to eligibility, we are just interested in your specific site. So all, all the, the eligibility cr criteria that I mentioned earlier is site specific. All right, that is fantastic to hear. Um, thank you again, Scott. I think that is about all we have time to answer today. Uh, if you asked a question and we weren't able to get to it during the Q&A portion, uh, we will try and follow up with you after the webinar via email. Uh, so I did want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And before we wrap up for the day, I wanted to just share some quick information about Ohio EPA's upcoming webinars and some of our other programs that you might be interested in. So on April 18th, we have a webinar for an introduction to new construction and demolition debris rules. Join Ohio EPA to learn more about the new rules for C and DD processing facilities, which became effective in 2022. We will go over the background of these rules and explain which community partners and generators like land banks need to know about them. Uh, then for, on April 19th, we're having a webinar uh, for the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program. Ohio's Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program is hosting this webinar in preparation for the program's annual call for project nominations. The webinar will discuss important items such as getting the most out of your pre-nomination site visit, post-award construction oversight and management for restoration projects, a new tool to help implementers find potential sponsors, and more. And then May 2nd, you can join us for troubleshooting non-compliance at small wastewater treatment plants. Are you having problems operating your wastewater treatment plant? Non-compliance with NPDES permits? Is your wastewater treatment plant not running the way it's supposed to? Learn how the Compliance Assistance Unit uses cheap, easy, and effective process control tools to diagnose treatment problems and then monitor the treatment system to keep it in place. And then Ohio EPA has funding available for Ohio businesses, nonprofits, local governments, and schools through the Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant Program. Community and litter, market development, scrap tire, and academic institution grants help provide funding for many projects, such as litter cleanup events, purchasing recycling equipment, collecting scrap tires, and installing water bottle refilling stations in schools. For a full list of eligible projects and grant types, please visit RecycleOhio.gov or reach out to one of our Ohio EPA staff members for more information. Additionally, Ohio EPA's Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award Program recognizes an organization's exceptional achievements in environmental stewardship. Any business, industry, trade association, college, university, or professional organization in Ohio can be recognized by Ohio EPA for their commitment to environmental excellence. For application details, please reach out to our Ohio EPA staff or visit the E3 webpage listed at the bottom of the slide. E3 submissions are due April 30th to be recognized in this year's award cycle. To register for any of our upcoming webinars, please check out our agency event calendar at the link listed below. The events calendar is on our main webpage, and the link is also on Ohio EPA's webpage footer at the bottom of each webpage. To receive notifications of upcoming webinars, please go to our Ohio EPA Customer Support Center. You can create an account and then go to the option Subscribe to Updates, and then select the subscription option All Trainings, Webinars, and Conferences at the link on the side. Um, the Customer Support Center link also is at the bottom footer of each webpage.
If you missed any of our past webinars, you can go to DEFA's webpage at the link below on the slide, epa.ohio.gov slash divisions and offices slash environmental financial assistance slash training. Once on the DEFA webpage, click on the word training on the left-hand menu column. Here you will find recordings of trainings you may have missed. You can also go to our agency YouTube channel to view recorded webinars. We will post the recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, usually within about a week of today's webinar. We will also post a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides with the recording. The YouTube channel link can be found at the bottom of each of our web pages on that blue footer, and the YouTube icon is next to the Twitter icon on the bottom right side of our web pages as well. And with that, I will end today's webinar. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great day.